Hello and welcome to Stupid Ancient History with Midgley and Taylor and our expert, non-expert and special guest James, Lord High Commander of the Science Cupboard, first of his name and knower of nothing. Hello. <laughs> As always we're wearing togas and today we're going to look at the origins of Servius Tullius. Previously on Stupid Engine History, we've been looking at the rise and the reign of Tarquinius Priscus, the first of the Etruscan kings. Or the Tarquin kings. Yeah, or later Roman kings. Or party-wise. Yeah, the yeah, was party that's fine. Yeah. I'm enjoying this lot. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, after a slight, shall we say, manipulation of the interregnum, he made himself king by gaining favour with the patricians and the senate. You mean he bribed his way into power, basically? Yeah. How uh, dare he? <laughs> uh, but after a less than auspicious climb to power, he proved himself pretty successful as a king. He extended the political power of the Senate, he defeated the attacking tribes, and hosted a great celebration in the form of games. Again, what you actually mean is paying off his mates with cushy government jobs, starting a war to pay for building the Circus Maximus, and holding a massive party. I mean, if you remove the... Circus Maximus from that, that, <laughs> that could happen today. I was going to say, that sounds like our government, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, you also left out prostitutes. I assume they're involved somewhere. Every time. <laughs> Every time, isn't it, James? That's all you think about. I was just looking for some continuity in the, in the, in the story we're laying out. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> so it's fair to say that despite the criticisms of Tarquinius, um, he was something of a successful ruler. Yeah, and he was clearly aided by the fact that he was using his wealth to buy the support of the plebs. And it worked. Yeah. And, you know, and under him, arguably, Rome expanded. Um, and rather than having to spend time and effort sorting basic things out, most Romans were now enjoying more comfortable lives with more entertainment. Yeah, but it seems that towards the end of his reign, things maybe started to go slightly wrong mm. and slightly strange there things strange were things afoot. I love strange things, continue. <laughs> <laughs> well, Livy jumps straight in uh, and gives us this little anecdote. At that time, there was an event in the palace which was amazing in its outcome and appearance. There was a boy called Servius Tullius and as he slept, his head burst into flames. Of course it did. <laughs> <laughs> Get a fire extinguisher! <laughs> Just, just, what happened today? Oh, nothing much. Just, Kid right, set on fire, cracking. My head combusted, that's fine. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, it's not an, a day-to-day -day thing. Um, and this little episode isn't just going to be ignored. Yeah. So Livy gives us a little bit more. When one of the slaves had brought water to put out the flames, <laughs> <laughs> he was held back by the Queen Tanaquil. She wouldn't let the boy be disturbed and asked them all to be quiet until he woke up on his own. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, oh it's okay. Barbecue. Just, just, just <laughs> yeah. like, you know, you don't wake a baby. It's like, no, just, he's burning. Just leave him alone. Let him let him finish up. Just let if him you're waking simmer. him up, you're putting him back to bed later. Just let him simmer. He's not quite cooked yet. He needs a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not great parenting, is it? I mean, there's a baby on fire. Leave it. So, who, who was this boy? Why was he just... Ah. Oh, okay. Well, more. I'm not going to ask the question. <laughs> he was on fire. Let's leave it at that. No, I think we need to continue. <laughs> so, unless this takes just a really dark turn. <laughs> this doesn't end as the child on fire. Uh, not quite. No, there, is more, is more. there is more to the story. So, Libby says... Soon the flames died away and he woke up. Quite shocked, I would imagine. <laughs> oh yeah. I'm really warm. Um, then she took her husband Tarquinius away in secret and said, do you see this boy we are bringing up in our house in such a poor position? It is obvious that he will be the shining light and protector of the royal house when it is in trouble in worrying times. So let's look after this boy as best we can so that he will be useful to us and to the people. I mean, say looking after him as best we can. Not done a bang up job of it. He's so on fire. No. Yeah. I um, mean, God, this palace will smell of that horrible burning hair smell oh as well. God. Oh. <laughs> so, no one was. She seems to have taken this inner stride. No one was shocked by this burning child. No. Well, no, the slave no. with the water was. Well, probably, yeah. But, but no, she was like, oh no, no. Leave, leave, I got leave this. Leave it out, and oh, I can use this. Yeah. Okay. With with a lots of just 
randomly combusting children? Well, Probably not. Well, random children? Who, why was there a baby sleeping in the palace? Well, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay. But um, obviously, so this boy, Servius, he's raised in the royal palace by Tarquinius and Tanaquil. Yeah. Okay, so they just adopted a child, essentially. Well, well pretty much. Um, there is, of course... A lot more behind this because it's not good. just some random oh, fire oh, child. Be a pretty boring episode. <laughs> <laughs> so there's two ver- basically. Livy gives us two versions why this random, amazing flame boy, as he should have been is, called, is this a typical one sensible, <laughs> one's nonsense sort of thing? Uh, they're, they're both pretty. <laughs> yeah, they are. Both pretty so there's, there's two versions of where this kid has come from and why he's there, so. Yeah, so the first version is that Servius was the son of one of the slaves working and living in the palace. Okay. I think that sounds reasonably plausible. Yeah. Um, the second is that he is the, and it's more specific this one, he's the son of the Queen of Corniculum, which is a nearby settlement that had just been captured by the Romans. Uh, when they got there, captured it, the Queen was quite heavily pregnant at the time, so they brought her back to the palace, um, where she and Tanaquil become reasonably good friends, and obviously, out he comes. On fire. Not on fire. <laughs> fire comes later. Right, okay. Um, they both sound like nonsense. <laughs> yeah, um, but this is the nonsense we have to work this with. Is, this afraid. is Livy, after all. Either way, he's meant to be this slave boy. So did the mum, uh, what was her name? The Queen. The, we don't know her name. Oh, let's call, oh, let's oh, call her she, she's Linda. Queen of, yeah. Linda. Um, did she not object to them raising her child? Was she in favour of it? Do we know anything about we her? We don't know anything about her. Or not she, even her name. Did she just disappear from the story after She's this? just not there. I mean, maybe she's set on fire. God. We don't know. <laughs> no, she, whatever happened, he's there in he's the He's there palace. being raised by... And now on fire. Yes. But then it, the, the fire did go out. Does it, does it happen again? No. Oh. He's not an X man. <laughs> so, despite his humble or not so humble origins, Servius was raised in the royal palace because of the omen. Is that what they're calling it? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And supposedly, you know, he turned out to be a great all round chap. Or, as Livy puts it, he had a very royal nature, and none of the other young men in Rome looked like they would be as good as Servius as a son in law. So the king lets his daughter get engaged to him. Okay. Is, is this common? Because he's... going to say... <laughs> no. That is no they were brought up as brother or sister, basically. Yeah, no. I mean, obviously this is Livy and he says this is all to do with the will of the gods. Yeah. And, you know, Servius, because of his humble upbringings, he's destined to overcome all his obstacles. Humble? He said he was a prince. Slave prince. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But either way, he, he overcomes all his obstacles because the gods want it to be. Right, okay. But having a bit of huggy time with your sister is not necessarily something that is... Huggy time. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something that you don't see at all, is it? You know, Augustus, supposedly. It's always Augustus with us. Did you, are you just jealous? Yeah, your, your boyfriend's got a, a girlfriend who happens to be his sister. <laughs> no, but it is true. It's not that unusual, is it? It does crop up. Why are you asking me? Doesn't, I don't live in East Manchester. <laughs> I mean, oh God. How rude. I mean, we talked about the Ptolemies and they, yeah. they were all over that, weren't they? Yeah, but yeah. You, you do get kind of <clears throat> mentions of it in the sources that are linked with Rome. Because obviously the Ptolemies is more, it's Egypt, yeah. so it's seen as different. But you do get it mentioned in Rome as well. Okay. Slightly, anyway. So he's, now, he's now basically <laughs> married to his sister. Yeah, so he's now, but he's also now the son-in-law of Tarquinius Priscus, which so is the most important thing. Basically, he's going to be the next king. Well, that's what they're aiming for, I mean, it's the, it? name, it's the name of the episode, I'd be shocked <laughs> if he was an end-up king. Yeah, so it certainly, it seems that, especially Tanaquil, has got this idea in her head that he's going to be the next king. So do they only have... They only have a daughter. They don't have any of the sons. Who only a daughter, it seems. Yeah. Right, okay. So she's basically just using these omens, omens to her advantage, isn't she? And using them to kind of get what she wants, basically. Yeah, okay. but I mean, this, don't forget, this would be quite problematic because technically you still need an interregnum. This period, your favourite bit, this period between kings. When yeah. do we just do away with them <laughs> soon james okay Patience. Yes. yeah it shouldn't be too much of a problem should it as livy also tells us that servius was popular with both the king and the senate 
Okay. So it he sounds like he's got one. the backing. Of are they, are they the only ones basically. to decide this? The, the plebs don't get any. The people are meant to nominate, but, but okay. They nominate. So uh, this guy kind of is very obviously set himself up an air. Yeah, yeah. He's still alive. <laughs> How old is he? Oh, is the, he... the Tarquinius Priscus. Yeah, yeah, no, he he is still alive. I'm is glad he, you asked he, about is that. Is he planning to die anytime soon? Well, How he's old? not planning to die. Oh, is but. Been... Karma or the fates have something in store for Tarquinius. Oh, I thought you were going to say his wife was planning on dying. <laughs> <laughs> that would be more typical. Mm. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> there's there's something afoot. Yeah. So, okay. do you remember the two sons of Ancus Marcius? Yeah, I'm going to say yes. You know the ones he tricked when oh go off hunting and we won't, oh, yeah. we won't have an interregnum just at wandered all. Wandered off. <laughs> yeah. Well, Livy's got something to say about them too. So Is he it says. Like a moron. <laughs> So the two sons of Ancus, the previous king, were still angry because they lost the throne because they were tricked by their guardian Tarquinius and because a foreigner was king of Rome who was not even Italian. Shock mm. horror. They got even angrier when they saw that even after Tarquinius died, they wouldn't get the kingdom back and it would suddenly go to a slave. The crown which Romulus, who was now a god, and was the son of a god had worn when he was on earth would now be given to a slave a hundred years later. So they, they, they don't like that, do they? No, they're no. slightly snobby and a little bit racist. A little bit, yeah. So if if he's not Italian, what is he? Um, just just not Italian. It's just that, not. That's all that matters. Where have he, they he been? Can't. Just like Where have they been? hanging out in a forest. <laughs> yeah, yeah they probably were time. just like yeah. How do we go? Sitting there plotting their revenge. <laughs> no one's told me to come home. I'm not allowed yet. <laughs> So obviously, apparently, they are more concerned with the dignity of the city of Rome and her people rather than generally being miffed at being done out of the crown, according yeah. to Levy. Although, really... The, the, if it wasn't them, someone was going to do them out of the crown because they're clearly more... <laughs> well, you never know. They've got a cunning plan. But if, if, what is this cunning plan? What are they doing? Well, they plot to kill him. That's not that cunning. That's really <laughs> obvious. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, but they've got a really good idea because they choose two very fierce shepherds to do it for. What? <laughs> <laughs> do you, you, do you not think instantly, I need someone killing, fetch me a shepherd. If you can deal awesome. with an angry sheep, then you can <laughs> kill someone. Sheep it's the are, same thing. Sheep are quite placid animals. I've never, I've never met a shepherd, but I don't imagine they're particularly angry or what, <laughs> fierce, you say. Fierce. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. Do people normally recruit shepherds into the army? And I don't know. Do they have a reputation for being world class assassins? Uh, you, could probably, you could probably do some damage with a crook, but <laughs> you know, I'm probably going to say a sword <laughs> would be better. Took a sheep at some <laughs> they, uh, they like to they like to sheep their oh, victims. Oh. <laughs> what is wrong with you? <laughs> oh. So anyway, two assassin shepherds. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Perfect plan. No, I'm you... going to say this is... I, I, I've not made my feelings clear. Would they These have... are a pair of idiots. <laughs> would they have a sheepdog with them? I don't know. But I mean, you wouldn't see it coming, would you? You wouldn't be like, oh no, there's a shepherd. Maybe he's out to kill me. <laughs> maybe that's Because the they're not thing. dangerous. <laughs> yeah, but maybe that's that's part of the plan. Maybe if it's you can just soften a... him up. But, but then surely you'd get... Weaponise him. Weaponise then... you... the sheep. <laughs> oh my God. Weaponise the shepherds, not the sheep. <laughs> yeah, because that makes much more sense. <laughs> Why wouldn't you disguise an assassin as a shepherd? Why would you get an angry <laughs> shepherd? <laughs> Obviously quicker to get a shepherd and train him to be an yeah, assassin. Yeah, maybe there's just more shepherds knocking about than there are assassins. You'd hope so. It's also like a million soldiers you could pay. Mm, I don't know. Maybe. All right, I, I'm, I'm, I'm put, how do you have bets now? These guys are going to fail them morons. <laughs> So go on, I want you to tell me about these assassin shepherds. <laughs> okay, well, Livy says, they appeared in the porch of the palace with their normal tools, like, Cheap, a crook. Yeah, <laughs> and pretended to have a very violent argument so that all the royal guards looked at them. Then they both began to ask for the king and the noise had been heard in the palace so they got sent to the king. <laughs> so they've tricked the way into the palace. What? Who, who are his guards? The lictors. But then... I mean, clearly, he's got nothing better to do all well, day apart maybe, from listening to well, some maybe shepherds not, kicking right. off. Two guys who start kicking off, 
saying, I demand to see the king. Generally, that's when the people you don't let see the king. <laughs> yeah, that's right. true. I want to see the king. No. <laughs> yeah. But, okay, no. So. but either way, the Julie brought before the king by his top-notch security team. Oh, my God. <gasps> and this is what Livy says. At first, they shouted each other against the other to see who could make the most noise. Then the litter <laughs> told them off <clears throat> and said they should speak in turn and they became quiet. <laughs> so they have a shouting match, yeah, basically. The, the plan is clearly to shout <laughs> Tarquinius to death. Uh, I've changed my mind. Just everyone's an idiot. <laughs> well, but we've not finished yet. Oh, God. One of the two began to state his case. Whilst the king's attention was taken up by listening to him, the other swung his axe and pushed it into the king's head. He left the weapon in the wound and they both ran out of the palace. Where are his guards? <laughs> <laughs> And also, how interesting must that conversation have been that you couldn't tell that someone was swinging a massive axe at your head? But th there's a, another question, surely. Well, two questions. Since when do shepherds use axes? Yeah, they're normal tools, but also, surely, if you ain't the litters, remove all weapons. Yeah, the <laughs> security's the not very good. Any, any knives, any weapons? No. no. What about the axe? No, Tool of the trade, I'm allowed that, apparently. Yeah, the, the security oh. guards, seriously, the lictors seriously need to up their game. I thought they were meant to be good. Apparently not. Wow. And so, after 38 years on the throne, Tarquinius Priscus ends his rule with an axe in the head. But, obviously, the murder started to cause something of a commotion, <laughs> I would assume <laughs> so, amongst the people out in the streets, especially as the lictors grappled with the men trying to flee. So they're trying to get him now. They're actually doing something now, James. Oh, good! <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, ever the quick thinker, more than the lictors, clearly, <laughs> Tanaquil leaps into action. Okay. So, says so Tanaquil, during the chaos, ordered the palace to be shut. Clever woman. Should have done that before. Yeah. yeah. Throwing out all who were present at the same time, she carefully prepared everything necessary for dressing the wound, as if her hope still remained. At the same time, in case her hopes should disappoint her, she looked for other means of safety. She should have been in charge. She was in charge, <laughs> clearly. I wouldn't be surprised if she organised the shepherds. <laughs> I mean, it seems that, like, clearly she's already hedging her bets here, looking for, oh no, my husband's dead. Yeah. But she quite likes hanging around the palace and being important. So she's trying to find a way that she can be powerful and influential once he's dead. Yeah. You know, providing... If he does die of his wounds. Mm. But an axe in the head will help with that, won't it? it well, so. I mean, I'm sure you can get better from that. Mm. <laughs> Is that when you've got a splitting headache? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I really wish you could hear the look I'm giving her right now. <laughs> you probably can, actually. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've so been anyway. waiting for that. I bet, you, I bet when... When Mitch told you we were doing this, you're like, I've been waiting years to tell this joke. Yeah, great joke. It's going to be so funny. But yeah, so she's hedging a bet. She's looking for the next step. Yeah, and she's already, like, pretty much back to horse here, hasn't she? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, then... Her, her son-in-law. That's it, exactly. She calls for... She calls for her son-in-law, Servius. Yeah. Shock. Shock, <laughs> And then she begs him. You know, of the bleeding corpse of her husband. <laughs> she begs him to avenge Tarquinius' death and do not let the sons of Ancus take the throne. And she adds in this following kind of line, just to make sure. If your own plans are not ready because of the suddenness of this event, then follow mine. <laughs> wow. Do as you're told. <laughs> follow my plans. She's like, uh, uh, is this your plan? Did you, are you your shepherds? Wow. She... Okay. So her, her grand plan is mother knows best. Pretty much. And also, I'm going to stay in the palace and be in charge, basically. That's what she wants. Women yeah. always know best, James. She should have learned that by now. Otherwise, you'd get an axe. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems that before Servius can come up with a response, he's <laughs> clearly a bit shocked, uh, Tanaquil goes out to address the people on the street from a window in the palace, and she says... She bid them be good of courage that the king was stunned by the suddenness of the blow, that the weapon had not sunk deep into his body, that he had already come to himself again, 
that the wound had been examined, the blood having been wiped off, that all the symptoms were favourable, and she hoped they would see him very soon, and that in the meantime he commanded the people to obey the orders of Servius Tullius. Okay, so he's... Handy! Pop- <laughs> I really hope this ends with her just, like, propping you up like a puppet. Just, like, <laughs> waving at everyone. With the axe still in his head. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so she just told them, they're all fine, listen to my Everything son. is fine, yeah. nothing to see here. <laughs> yeah. This is this is fine. Yeah, listen to my son. She basically right. just hides the dead body. Okay. And keeps telling people that he's not dead. Surely at some point people will want to see him to... <laughs> You've seen Weekend at Birdies. I have to. I am aware that most people listening to this may not have seen Weekend at Birdies. I've not even seen You should. That. I don't even know what you that is. You definitely should. But yeah, basically she's kind of making him de facto king. Okay. Cool. <laughs> so, Tanaquil then went to great lengths to hide the death of the king, like we just said, while Servius could try and strengthen his position, kind of in the meantime. Yeah, because okay. obviously he's only the de facto king whilst Tarquinius is so recovering. Is it, yeah, so is this just biding time so he can people can see him in charge and get yeah. confidence in him sort of Yeah, thing? so he acts as this stand-in king yeah. um, for a while and the Senate particularly can see, well, he's pretty good. He's a fine character, makes good judgment. So this isn't just a lie to the plebs? The, no, the it's, Senate it's everyone. Thing. No one seems right. to know. It's like, oh, yeah, he's all right. And then when they feel the time is right, Tanaquil and Servius, they announce the death of the king and... Servius, supported by a strong guard, took possession of the kingdom by the consent of the Senate, being the first who did so without the orders of the people. Ah, uh, okay. So he, he basically, they have a mini interregnum. Yeah. He sneaks in, going... Who else are you going to have? This guy. This guy. <laughs> What's got two thumbs and should be the next king? This, this guy. guy. Oh, is he going to be that one? <laughs> well, no, the announce <laughs> the he's corpse dead. The kind of kind of corpse king. <laughs> uh, so, if he's just, you know, taking over Rome, what happened to the two sons? The of sons of Hankers. Well, yeah. they, they hear what happened. So, um, did they just, when... when after they're still sighting the forest going... They just legged it. They didn't stick around and try and muster support. They just well, no, it's the shepherds who tried running. Oh, the of course. The two sons of yeah, Anchors yeah, yeah. are still in the forest going, do you think it worked? <laughs> do you think it worked? Maybe next time we don't use shepherds. Maybe next time we use... An army. So, they didn't even position themselves to be in Rome no. when it happened and kind of, you know, try and state their claim. No. So they find out what happens, and then at that point they just abandon all hope and leg it as far as they can. They just give it up as a bad job. Do we do we ever find out? Because I hope they had horrible deaths. Then <laughs> we don't know. Oh, you can so you can, rubbish. You can make one up. What do you think? What do you want to happen? Maybe to? we just wandered off a cliff <laughs> <laughs> onto a pile of dead shepherds. <laughs> <laughs> the previous attempt got crushed crushed by sheep. You know what? There's they're probably like sheep. Sheep are so stupid. They're such like unintelligent animals. I was on a farm in Wales once, and some the farmer was trying to catch a sheep to give it some medicine. He just kept walking away, away, and away from it. It walked off a hill. <laughs> and I bet that's what they've done. <laughs> idiots. Oh yeah, idiots aside. So yeah, Tarquinius is dead. Axe in the head. Servius has made himself the new king. I've seen more. And the sons of Ancus have. Of- Managed to fall off the ground. Oh, God. So after that series of unfortunate events, depending on which side of the fence you're looking Mm -hmm. at, quite fortunate for Servius, um, we should look at, again, the key themes. So one of the things that gets raised again is this idea that Servius is not a Roman. He's a slave king. He's a foreigner. Um, The sons of Anchor seem really bothered about this but what, what what are the criteria for being king because there's no real succession it's never really been it's just whoever's best but the thing the sons of anchors clearly have forgotten is rome has quite regularly had yeah. non-roman kings yeah romulus wasn't roman Numa wasn't roman anchors himself was only half roman yeah you know so they're making a big deal out of something that generally if you're looking at the continuity throughout the interregnums shouldn't be a thing they would have they would have been the odd ones out wouldn't they not Um, the other way around they're the one does does that exist yet because i know when you look at like the empire there's this idea of roman and it's very like it's a a thing to aspire to be like an honorable roman 
Does that exist yet, or is, are they still just so much of a rabble that? The, that they're idea certainly not the the rabble that Romulus puts together. Well, no, yet, well, they've yeah. not been a kingdom for long. Have no, they? they're, they're still quite transient. So again, you get this idea that the sons of Ancus, their arguments are pretty, they're pretty baseless. Mm. Again, they are not really Roman themselves. They have non-Roman lineage. Um, they would be unusual in that they would be trying to go for this kind of dynastic approach that they would take over from their dad, which again suggests they didn't really have a rightful claim to the throne, just, oh, my dad was king, can I be king? Mm. So they seem to be making a lot of fuss over nothing. That's part of the point, that even though technically Servius comes to power without the will of the people, all of the people, he's still significantly better than what else yeah. was on offer. I mean, their heads did not set on fire. <laughs> Let's not forget that. I mean, omens are really, no, really normally important. Normally I'd say it's a good thing that your head's not on fire. No. Apparently not. I don't know. No. There's a few leaders at the minute that I think if their head did set on fire, it wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah, but fiery head in that case doesn't mean they're good leaders. No, I know. I just <laughs> want to see their head set on fire. <laughs> wow. If you are listening in from a foreign intelligence service, please do not come after us. Um, but yeah, it's think back to... At least, at least not me, I didn't yeah. say anything. <laughs> it's Taylor, she lives in East Manchester. <laughs> Just listen and you'll hear her. I don't live in Cheshire, actually. East Manchester. Anyway, before we give out your address on the internet. <laughs> so yeah, so the, the omens are obviously really kind of important still at this early stage in Roman development, Romulus and his birds, yeah. Numa looking for signs, um, Tullus messing things up and getting struck by lightning. So obviously this fiery child, mm. um, they take it as a good omen, especially you know if he's that good that as a baby can put a fire out without waking up, uh, it's pretty good. But also it seems like to be a, to be king or to be a leader in Rome you have to have an omen <laughs> that seems to be the de facto thing now doesn't it yeah he's got to be an omen to suggest that, that you're going to be like leader decreed yeah the gods are choosing the leaders yeah. of Rome so um so on a more practical uh kind of you know practicality has no room here. I, I know but realistically did they just pick someone who they could control from a young age and make king possibly i mean again that would suggest that tanaquil is this puppet mistress yeah. behind yeah everything. so it's really important because tanaquil forms shall we say the start of this idea of women being kind of behind the scenes controlling the manipulators yeah manipulating okay. kind of power so women can't have power themselves so they can't ever become king or yeah. queen or you know like they can't ever become emperor but what they can do is they can kind of control things behind the scenes so she's the first of quite a few so Livia Augustus's wife is someone that controls lots of different things and has quite an important say in how things are run in Rome in particularly in relation to like morality laws and marriage laws and things like that. Was that seen as a good or a bad thing at the time? Well it's it's not normally viewed as being something that's very positive so you've got her you've got Fulvia if you remember when we did about Mark Antony and yes. then obviously we've got Cleopatra yeah and then we've also got someone that we don't really study anymore but we've got Agrippina as well and they're all women who are part of the imperial household that should be quiet subservient sat in a corner being pretty yeah looking pretty and just being there to kind of look after their men folk when actually what they're doing is kind of controlling people like pitting people against each other, moving people like to the front. Playing the game. Yeah, yeah, playing the power game, moving people up to the uh, front. Obviously, they they're like proto-feminists. Yeah. Um, but obviously, they get written down as evil manipulators <laughs> rather than desperately trying to keep their stupid husbands in check. Is this, yeah. is this how she's kind of portrayed in all of Livy? Because like, this is being written when Augustus comes to power. Is this him kind of saying women know your place almost or it's it's making like, men aware of that no it, it's, it's part like roman literary tradition yeah women in the ancient world in ancient narratives and histories tend to be either good and pious and nice and pretty and doing what they're told Damn or <laughs> evil scheming villainous so you have snow white or you're the wicked queen that, yeah, that, yeah. That, that, there's, there's no like happy there's, there's no mid ground no and normally what tends to happen is 
either it all goes horribly wrong and they just fall completely out of favour or they end up dying a horrible-ish death. Okay. Or things go well. Yeah, but they they, yeah. they just disappear from the narrative. Well, things, yeah. things um, seem to be going quite well here. Yeah, well, this is the other thing. Is she just trying to maintain her own importance or is she actually trying to bring some stability to Rome? Clearly, she sees that she's got this um, bright, gifted, future leader yeah. in hand after the old leader has just been murdered. Is she just ushering in what she sees as the ideal leader? Hmm. Yeah, and it, there are again, there are massive parallels between Julius Caesar and Augustus. Hmm. Caesar is murdered, not by shepherds. No, no. <laughs> um, and Augustus is sort of. <laughs> ushered in to replace him in that same kind of adopted and again it's now adopted son isn't yeah. it yeah yeah and you see loads of other examples like this so she can come across as quite manipulative but not as bad as some of them yeah this is this is the full extent of oh she did this and she did this mm. yeah agrippina like i say we don't really look at agrippina she gets you, a but really bad agrippina up. yeah gets a really bad write-up as does obviously cleopatra gets a really bad write-up as well but that is because they they're kind of i don't know why really but they just seem to do more and it's as if they kind of manipulating things throughout a really long period of time it's more that they they are more contemporary to the writers we know stuff yeah. about agrippina yeah. we know stuff about cleopatra we've got archaeological evidence and court records whereas tanaquil it's sketchy whether she existed yeah so there is that um and aside away from women the other big change that's coming along is obviously it seems now we've seen the end of the interregnum I is there any evidence to see how the Romans felt about these? Because they've not gone well. <laughs> no, well, we know the Romans did not like kings um, yeah. by the end of it, but mm. we're I, I starting don't... to move towards the end of the king. So this, the interregnum has basically started to disappear. Here yeah. comes Servius. It's kind of like we've chosen the best man for the job already. Just put up with it. Mm. You know, um, he doesn't get, he rules with the will of the Senate. He doesn't come to power with the will of the plebs yeah but then he goes about winning the will of the plebs and you'll see when we do the next one there are really obvious comparisons between Servius and Augustus yeah okay. and that also is another kind of really important facet isn't it to like Roman leadership in that you've got to have the control of the army <coughs> but you've also got to have the the support should I say not control if you've got to have the support of the Senate and also the people. So this, this idea about kind of bread and circuses, keeping them happy, that's really important. And okay. that's the only way that you're going to maintain power. Mm -hmm. Is, um, I know, I know we know who we're talking about, but uh, Tarquinius, was that? Yeah. Yeah. Was he the first one to kind of do this grand games thing to keep them happy and get them, in, get them on There were festivals, but yeah, he seems to be the first who uses it as a means of pacifying. And that just continues through Roman tradition. Yeah. Cool. So there you have it, our quick look, bit longer look than we planned. Um, <laughs> quick look at the rise of Servius Tullius to the throne of Rome. Uh, thank you for listening. We hope this has been helpful. As always, leave us a comment below. And until next time, goodbye. Bye. Bye.